morning, everyone. Uh, so yesterday we had a look at a few uh, sort of applications to titration calculations. Uh, we found that especially if we had a polyprotic acid, an acid that actually has multiple protons, uh, we can actually hit multiple equivalence points. Uh, basically, uh, usually when we balance the equation, we assume that things are titrated to completion, but maybe we've only added enough base to actually get rid of one out of the two protons, or two out of the three protons, and we saw a quick calculation with that. Uh, we saw a problem as well, because titrations actually help us identify the unknown concentration, actually helps us uh, count the number of particles in your uh, mixtures, we can actually calculate over uh, to find some unknown molar mass and also some percent purity. So uh, I'm just going to give you a quick practice question uh, for a molar mass style problem. We'll see how we do. I encourage you to draw a picture as you're uh, working with this here, uh, and then later on uh, we're going to take a look at indicators. So. Uh, this is a question uh, from your workbook here. We'll do this as a warm-up. Uh, I'm going to give you a 1.021 gram weak base. I'm just going to represent it as B minus. Right? Uh, this one here is dissolved into 100 milliliters. So that's your volumetric flask here. That was your first solution. Uh, again, we're going to pull a couple aliquots uh, samples. These samples here are going to be 25 milliliter portions. Uh, three 25 milliliter portions or aliquots uh, were titrated. You can just think of this word here, titrated as reacted to completion. Okay. And you've actually hit an equivalence point. Um, uh, we're titrated with 0 0.05023 molar HCl. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you the different trials here. So trial one, one, two, three. Uh, instead of giving you the initial and the final Barrett readings here, I'm just going to give you how much acid that added. So this is the volume of HCl added. And let's say after you did your subtraction of numbers here, the first trial ended up giving you uh, 17.84, the next trial giving you 17.79, the last trial 17.81. Right. Uh, I want you to see if you can calculate the molar mass, and I'm going to give you the uh, equation here. Uh, I want you to calculate the molar mass. And the reason why we need the equation is because we need the balance um, ratios. So essentially we have a weak base. I don't know what it is. It's B minus. It's going to react with HCl. Being a bronze lorry uh, base, it's supposed to accept a proton. It's going to steal the proton from HCl. It's going to go up by an H, go up by a charge, so HB, and the CL is just going to leave behind one charge. For these reactions, they just head in one direction, so therefore just a one-way arrow. Okay. So uh, I encourage you, again, to pause the video, try it out for yourself, see if you can actually calculate over, uh, well, what is this unknown amount? As always, I want to just start off with a picture, assuming that you've done that here. Start off, uh, we started off with the 1.021 uh, grams of our base. I can assume, again, that's solid. That's usually why I have it in uh, grams. I'm going to dissolve it first into 100 milliliters. So my first pitcher is actually 100 milliliters. I don't use up all 100 to do my titrations. I end up pulling out a few fractions. These aliquots here are each 25 milliliters um, a portion. And I titrate each of these samples here. This is the amount of acid volume that we actually end up using to titrate these 25 milliliters. I'm doing the titration to find the concentration. That concentration of each of the aliquots would apply to the concentration of the whole pitcher, and that would actually help you figure out grams per moles at the really, really end. Okay, So let's just uh, try it out here. Let's just focus on the really end here, the actual titrations between the 25 milliliter samples and these uh, average trials. Usually, if these three trials were really far off from each other here, I just average all three. I am noticing these two are slightly close together, but they're not all that bad. So let's imagine just averaging these three numbers. How do I average numbers? You just add them all up and then just divide it by three. So 17.84 plus 17.79 plus 17.81 divided by three. That tells me on average, how much acid have you added? The average is actually 17.81, right? somewhere in the middle. So of the acid, I'm using 0 0.01781 liters. Uh, the HCl was given to me as a concentration 0 0.05023. For my aliquot, although I didn't know the molarity yet, 
My aliquots I had pulled was just 25 milliliter portions, so 0 0.02500 liters. Uh, you'll see that we actually had converted over to liters because uh, whenever we multiply by molar, moles per liter, uh, it has to be liters. So what I'm going to do is I've done the titrations in order to figure out what is the unknown amount of base that we had, find moles, mole ratio, and then use the 0 0.025. Once you have the concentration of each of those aliquot samples here, that concentration applies to the entire beaker. We're going to find moles and we can find grams per moles later on. So let's just uh, go our way through here. What is the concentration of B minus? Start off with the chemical that we know. So 0, 0.0. On average, you had dropped in 17.81 uh, milliliters of HCl. We multiply by the concentration 0 0.05023 moles for a given liter. Uh, the mole ratio gives me for every one part HCl, there is one part of your B minus. I have no clue what the chemical B minus is, so B minus is just a placeholder. But that's the number of moles. The part that I titrated was actually against the 25 milliliter portion, so I'm just going to divide out 1 over 0 0.02500 liters. So 0 0.01781 times 0 0.05023 divided by 0 0.025 gives me the concentration of base is actually 0, 0.0. 3578. Right, I have a lot of significant figures here. That's the whole point of doing a titration. Okay. So these are the uh, titrated samples here. The concentration of base in each of these aliquots was 0 0.03578. Obviously, the total volume would now be some 30, 40 mils or so. We don't care about the final volume in the Erlenmeyer. All we care is now that we have the initial concentration, that concentration actually applies to your whole solution. The whole solution is also 0 0.03578. I've used the pitcher of orange juice analogy here. If you taste the uh, orange juice in the pitcher, you pour it in a cup of glasses, the taste is actually the same. The, this is the concentration in the cup. This is actually the concentration in the solution as well. So what I'm going to do here as a last step, I'm going to find how many moles are in my actual pitcher of orange juice, and then I'm just going to go grams per mole, and therefore I would have found uh, the molar mass. So how many moles of uh, B minus do we have? I'm going to specify this is in the 100 mil uh, solution in the entire pitcher. So not just the aliquots. Uh, now that's already been uh, neutralized away. So let's take our 100 milliliters, convert it to liters. 0 0.100 liters. If the concentration of the whole container is also 0 0.03578 molar, uh, this gives us here uh, times 0.1. So 3.578 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. That's how many particles are actually inside your pitcher. And then at long last, we're going to calculate the molar mass. I'm going to use uh, capital M also for molar mass. Usually that's the unit for concentration, right? So this one here is molar mass. The units is actually going to be gram per mole. You're going to do whatever you can to get a gram on top and a moles on bottom. Well, the grams that I dissolved in was 1.021 grams. And then the moles that you just calculated was actually in the pitcher, 3.578 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. Grams per mole, 1.021 divided by this answer gives us a molar mass of 285.3 grams per mole. Okay? So, again, via titration, the whole point of titration is to find some unknown concentrations. And we've actually done a little bit of a spin-off of it. Once you know the concentration, you can go from the aliquots to the big sample, and you can determine molar mass. In yesterday's lesson, we also determined uh, purity as well. Okay. We are going to look at titrations in a little bit of a different way over the next couple of classes. One important thing for a titration, unfortunately, a lot of the acid and base neutralizations that we deal with, unfortunately, all of them are sort of colorless. So I need to know when to actually stop the titration. In our labs, what we had done is we had actually threw in an acid-base indicator. We're just going to take another look at some of these indicators here. Okay. So what I pulled out here is actually in your data booklet, you actually have a table of these indicators. Uh, there's about maybe 12, 13 indicators going down here. They give us the name of the indicator. They give us a pH change, uh, pH range at which the color change occurs. So somewhere between a pH of 0 and a pH of 1.6, usually what we do is we just simplify and we go, okay, let's just take the halfway point, 0 0.8. What is the color change um, from? It actually gives us the colors for this indicator. It actually changed from a yellow, anything less than 0 0.8, uh, to a blue that's anything more than 0 0.8. Realistically, it is somewhere more gradual. Maybe by 0.4, we are already starting to change color, but just for simplicity, we just divide it in two there. Uh, the indicator that we're familiar with here is actually phenethylene. Phenethylene actually changes color quite late. So here's the pH range. 
For phenethylene somewhere between 8.2 and 10 on the pH scale, it changes from colorless to pink. We've been so far simplifying things a little bit. We've been saying in the acid, it's colorless, in the base is pink. And we're actually now getting a little bit more detail. It's actually at a dividing line of what, 9.1? We can take an average between 8.2 and 10. Anything less than 9.1, so a pH of 8, which is technically basic, you're still on the acidic side of the indicator, it's still going to be colorless. And then on the other side, once it's anything more than 9.1, that's when it turns to a pink color. Usually I choose an indicator for my titration that the instant that the indicator changes color, that's when you want to stop. That's when we were looking for that really trace uh, faint pink color. If you hold it up against a white background, the color should stay for about 20, 30 seconds or so. Uh, if you unfortunately overshoot uh, the base, it's going to become way too pink. Now you're going to have so much extra base and you don't actually have a good count of how much uh, acid particles were actually neutralized. So I just want to qualify a few things for an indicator here and show you a quick calculation. And we're going to then apply this uh, to our titration uh, setups in upcoming lessons. So for an indicator here, we're going to choose the indicator that we're familiar with, so phenethylene. On this chart here, it gives us, okay, there's actually a range at which it changes, right? So somewhere between a pH 8.2 to pH 10. Um, I'm going to just put my pH ruler just down below here. We are going to use 7 as a dividing line. This is neutral. So technically, somewhere between a pH of 8.2, which is actually basic, upwards to 10, uh, this is the pH range at which the color uh, change occurs. I'm going to do the dividing point here. That's going to be 9.1. And for phenethylene, it says it switches from the acid color, which is colorless, and switches over to pink. So anything that's a pH actually less than this 9.1, we're going to say it's colorless. As it switches through this 9.1, we're going to call this a transition point. That's a special point for this indicator. It's actually going to be pink. So even though technically the solution is actually basic between 7 and 9.1, it stays colorless, but it hasn't quite changed color to the pink just yet. What I want to introduce for these indicators, all the indicators that we have are going to be weak, organic, acids, or bases. Okay? So a couple key features here is them being organic, is they're going to have a really complicated structure. I'm not going to bother drawing out the structure for you. Another important thing here is it's a weak acid or a weak base. Weak things we know are going to end up in equilibrium. Well, indicators can change color back and forth depending on whether I'm adding acid or adding base. Um, so uh, that's how we're going to deal with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a placeholder. Well, let's imagine we have a weak organic acid. I'm going to say this is H in. This in here is just a placeholder for the rest of the molecule. That's the could be a ring, could be a large organic structure. But basically, this H here tells you this is the indicator in the acid form. It's in the protonated form. It actually has the proton currently. What this indicator can do is it can ditch the proton. If you start throwing in enough base, it's going to ditch the proton. It's going to go down by an H, go down by a charge. I'm going to still have the rest of the indicator molecule, IN, but I'm going to have a minus, and this is now going to be in the base form. So we talked about this thing here being weak. So this one here is an equilibrium. So you can change color back and forth. The nice thing about an indicator is the acid happens to have one color. For phenethylene, it was actually colorless. Uh, the base form is a totally different color. I'm not going to ask you why things are colored, but you just need to know in uh, the two different forms, you actually have two different colors. And that's when you actually sort of change color. Now let's pretend. So every indicator has its own particular chemical structure. It even has its own Ka. We'll get back to that calculation. Let's pretend we are in a very acidic solution. In an acidic solution, the H plus concentration is high. So imagine you have uh, just HCl, it's acid. You drop in a few drops of this phenethylene, right? This phenethylene here has this H in, in minus sort of relationship. Because there's so much H plus in this container already, what is it going to do to this equilibrium? Well, this indicator equilibrium here has a lot of H plus. It's like uh, increasing the H plus on the right-hand side. This is actually going to shift the equilibrium to, to the left. We can say here for my indicator equilibrium, EQM is equilibrium. The equilibrium shifts left or shifts towards products. Um, equilibrium shifts left uh, to produce more H in. Right? So one conclusion that we can have is uh, the concentration of H in is going to be higher than the concentration of N minus because we are shifting towards making more of it. 
And basically, not only is the indicator in acid, the indicator is in the acid form, HN. It's also going to demonstrate uh, the color of HN. Okay? So it's kind of a little weird, right? So we're already in acidic solution. Because of all those protons, it's forcing any indicator minus that I have to pick up the H plus to shift over. I actually have the indicator in the acid form. So right now here, my phenethylene would be colorless. What if we did the opposite? What if we were in a heavily basic solution? In heavily basic solution here, the H plus concentration is very low. Right? Uh, it's never going to be zero because water can always self-ionize. Let's imagine we have our container again. This far here, we have a lot of NOH. So we have a lot of hydroxide around. Remember, there's an inverse relationship between OH minus and H plus. Although water will self-generate a little bit of H plus, it's not going to be a lot. So what's going to happen to this uh, equilibrium? Again, we have H in, equilibrium with H plus and N minus. In a solution that is heavily basic, we're going to have very low H plus. So that's going to be like I would have pulled down the H plus concentration and actually caused this equilibrium to actually shift to the right. So the equilibrium shifts towards uh, products, and therefore, we're going to actually have more of the base form than the acid form. The base form would have been color number two. That's when we would actually switch color over to indicator minus uh, that color. Okay. Um, so again, just a conclusion here. Uh, the indicator is in the base form in basic solution. We are so lacking in terms of H plus around, any acid form here is going to just sort of convert over to try to replenish some of the H plus. That's actually going to force the N minus to be in the base form. And for phenethylene as an example, this one here was actually a pink color. So we've just crossed over from a situation where the acid form was predominant, acid color, or now the base form is predominant, now the base color here. We're going to cross through a point here called the transition point. And every indicator has its own transition point. Transition point is also sometimes called the end point. Careful, this is different from the equivalence point terminology that we've been seeing before. At the transition point, as you may have guessed here, this is when the acid form of the indicator has just matched up with the N minus form, the base form of the indicator. Neither of them are going to be predominant here. This is, transition point is going to occur midway in the pH range. So for phenethylene, which changed from 8.2, the acid form, to 10.0, I know it's a logarithmic scale. I know it's not perfectly going to be even. But if I just took the halfway value, this one here is 9.1, the pH of 9.1 would actually show a combination of colors. I would have equal number of things that are colorless and equal number of things that are pink. And therefore, that's why we're looking for the pale pink color. And if you look at other indicators, some of them change from yellow to blue. We'll have an equal number of yellow particles and blue particles here. We're going to end up having a green solution. We're going to have a color that's sort of intermediate between those two colors. They're never going to ask you something really fancy like, what is fuchsia and magenta and turquoise mixed up? It should be fairly obvious in terms of mixing. Let's say it was red and yellow, well, the in-between is going to be orange. So realistically, as you go from 8.2, it already starts changing color. Just for simplicity here for math, we're actually going to just put the halfway point, and that's going to be the transition point. That's going to be the point when we're going to get the uh, intermediary color, so the middle color, intermediate color. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to end off here is just going to show you a little bit of math that we can do at transition point. I want you to consider this equilibria again. So. We have the acid form, it's an equilibrium with H plus and N minus. The indicator could very well have been a weak base. It would still have an acid base equilibrium like this. The thing I want to emphasize here is because each indicator has its own chemical structure, every indicator has its own Ka. And we're going to see a link to how does the Ka come into play here. Let's just try to calculate what is the Ka generically from an indicator. Ka is basically KEQ, it's products over reactants. So it's going to be the H plus times the base form divided by the HN. This is a general relationship. This will be true for the indicator at any point, regardless of what the color is. We're going to make a simplifying assumption here. What if we are at the end point? 
What if we are at this very special point for this indicator where the acid form has actually equaled the indicator minus form? So we're going to be at the end point. Remember, at the end point, we just said the acid form has just matched up to the base form. That's when we get the intermediary color. Well, when the acid form and base form are actually the same, these guys here actually cancel out. It actually gives us a nice relationship. At the end point, at this color change point, the Ka is actually the H plus in solution at this point. And better yet, sometimes the H plus here is a very tiny uh, order of magnitude. What we're going to do is let's just take the negative log of both sides. Right? This one here will give me pKa. Right? P anything is going to be negative log of that thing. It's going to give you pKa divided by the pH. And I'm going to emphasize here again, this is the pH at end point. Okay? So this is a relationship, pretty easy to derive. I can just memorize that one there. So they can actually ask you, so for phenethylene, we had the transition point, the special color change point, that pale pink color happens at pH 9.1. They can ask you, well, calculate the Ka of this indicator. Well, wait a second, how do I do that? I don't know the structure. We said it's organic. We had to put a placeholder. Because we have this relationship between pKa and the pH at this middle point here, we can actually calculate the Ka fairly easily. If the pKa is actually equal to this 9.1, that's the color change point for this phenethylene. To undo the p part, I just need to go anti-log negative 9.1, and that one there gives me. So shift log, anti-log of a negative uh, 9.1 gives me here 7.9 times 10 to the negative 10. So this is a very common multiple choice question. Oh, here's a bunch of indicators, calculate the Ka. As long as you know this relationship is fairly easy, if you don't know this relationship, we're completely lost. And what I want to show you, just based on this sort of indicator table here, every indicator has its own special middle pH. So methyl violet, its special pH is 0.8. That's when its color change occurs. The Ka value will be quite a bit higher for methyl violet. We just chose phenethylene. Phenethylene happened to change between 8.2 and 10. That's why you chose 9.1. That then gives you the Ka of just phenethylene. We're going to use this uh, table uh, one more time in a quick twist. Uh, one thing I want to point out before we do that here is most of the indicators on this table only appear once. There is one indicator that actually appears twice, and that is actually this chemical here, um, thymothaline. Okay? So thymothaline here, or sorry, thymo blue. Uh, thymo blue here occurs once. Let me just draw this on a pH ruler so you can see it here. Somewhere between 1.2 and 2.8, I'm going to do the halfway point, which is 2. So at a pH of 2, it switches from red over to yellow. So we have red uh, on the acid side, and we have yellow on the basic side. So it's red here, we have yellow here. We would have imagined that it's yellow forever. But thymo blue actually shows up again later on. There's another special pH, somewhere between 8 and 9.6. The midway point is 8.8. .8. Let's just do that 8.8 .8 point. That's when it crosses over between yellow over to blue. Now good, it's consistent. Something less than 8.8 .8 is actually yellow. It just turns out there's actually another transition point. There's another color change point. But it does switch over from yellow upon going past 8.8 .8 more basing than that. It then switches over to blue. Uh, this indicator actually has a complicated structure. Thymo blue. Thymo blue is actually a diprotic uh, indicator. It's an H2 indicator. And what would happen here is we would actually have when it has two protons, when it is diprotic, this one here is color number one, that's the red color. Uh, upon starting on with a really acidic solution and starting to sort of become more basic, less and less acidic, I basically would switch this H2 in uh, to become the indicator minus form. So H plus and H in minus. This is going to be color two. That color two here is actually going to be yellow already. Most indicators only have one equilibrium because they only have one proton to get rid of. But thymol blue, because it actually had two protons to get rid of, this HN minus can later on, if you get basic enough, the HN minus can ditch another H plus and end up giving you H uh, indicator minus two. This was already color two. This was our yellow color. And we can actually uh, have uh, color three, right? And that one here is actually our blue color. Uh, because, chemically speaking here, for the first protonation, there would be a particular Ka for this. The special pH is very, very acidic. It's pH of 2. There's a Ka for my conjugate uh, base, or that uh, next form here. 
that one there also has its own Ka. Turns out to be a little bit less acidic, so its changing color point is actually a little bit later. But there we go, we get this sort of along the spectrum. What this actually allows us to do, although every indicator is expected just to change color once, uh, this time it was a little bit weird to change the color twice, we can actually make a mixture of indicators. This is actually where we get our whole notion of a universal indicator. Let me just do this on the side here. A universal indicator here is essentially, one way of making it, is essentially going to be a mix of indicators. So a mixture of indicators. Every indicator will have its own special endpoint, a special pH where it starts changing color, and depending on what's in the mix, the overall color will be a blend of all the colors. So let me just hint at how we're going to do this. Uh, I just drew what the thymol, uh, thymol blue uh, indicator looks like. So let's drop in a few drops of thymol blue. I'm just going to redraw that scale here. And I want to just sort of line up my pH scale. So for thymol blue, pH of 2, the midway, uh, the midway point between 1.2 and 2.8, it switches from red to yellow at a pH of 8.8. .8, it switches over to blue. That was a little weird. It already changed color twice. What if I mixed in a little bit of phenethylene? Right. Now, phenethylene only changed color once. Its special pH here was at 9.1. So lining up the pH ruler here, 9.1 is a little bit beyond there. Phenethylene switches from colorless over to pink. So anything less than 9.1 is actually colorless and it's actually going to switch to a pink color after 9.1. Uh, let's throw in one other indicator there. Uh, let's throw in a maybe one of these indicators here that uh, switch color uh, in the middle. Uh, let's throw in some bromothymol blue. So bromo blue. Bromo blue here at its special pH, technically somewhere between 6 and 7.6. The halfway point here would be 6.8. It switches from yellow to blue, so 6.8 is its special pH. At that point there, it would be changing color. It would be that midway point. This is now going to switch from yellow over to blue. And now if my universal indicator, just matching just these three indicators here, our overall solution just has a generic pH. Now there's going to be a few different pH readings that uh, it might potentially change color. So if my solution, so I had mixed in those three indicators, if my solution happens to be less than a pH of 2, What's my color going to be? Well, the thymol blue is going to be in the red color. Phenethane will be colorless. The bromo blue is yellow. Red and yellow end up making orange. So my solution will be orange, less than 2. Then what happens is the thymol blue actually changes color. Between 2 and 6.8, I mix a yellow, a colorless, and a yellow. We're going to get yellow until we're at a 6.8. Then the bromo blue actually changes color. So the thymol blue here is still yellow. Uh, the phenethylene doesn't care yet. It's still colorless. Yellow mixed with the bromo blue would have bromo blue changed to a blue color. Yellow and blue here changes now to a green color. So although every indicator is expected just to change color once, because I have a mixture of indicators and every indicator changes color as its own special pH, we're going to have a mixture of colors. So uh, after this, uh, at 8.8, .8, the thymol blue switches to blue. Uh, we have blue between 8.8 .8 and 9.1. So blue, the phenethylene is still uh, colorless and blue. So we're going to have blue for a little while, okay, not for long. This is 8.8 .8 and this is 9.1. And then we're going to start getting, finally, the phenethylene changes color. We just have blue and pink, uh, I don't know, maybe a purple-ish color. So even though every indicator only changed color once, with the exception of thymol blue changing color twice, by mixing a couple indicators, I now have this actually changing color at five, five different colors at very unique pHs. Okay? So that's how you can deal with a universal indicator. Uh, there, is, there are some chemicals that actually have enough protons that they can accommodate all the color changes themselves, but this is another way of making a universal indicator. Okay? So just have a look over your questions and let me know if you have any problems. Thanks, guys.